Tonight's lecture is the London Hellenic Society lecture for 2011. And it's hosted here at the school by the Hellenic Observatory, which is in the European Institute. Now, the London Hellenic Society uh, is a society with a very long history, 150 years or more, devoted to a better understanding of Greece here in the UK. The society supports a number of social and cultural activities, and we are honored to be supporting, to be uh, hosting this lecture uh, this evening. And we're delighted to welcome the president of, of the society, uh, George Rodopoulos, and his wife, uh, who I can see in the audience. Previous lectures in this series have included lectures by his All Holiness, uh, the Patriarch Bartholomeus, uh, as well as uh, Mrs. Dora Bakoniani when she was the uh, mayor of Athens. Now, the London Hellenic Society lecture is an opportunity for us to take another look at Hellenism today from different perspectives, different contexts. For this year's lecture, we thought of looking beyond Greece. And of course, our speaker this evening comes from much further afield. George Pisos has lived in South Africa for the last 70 years. 13 years before that, he'd been born in Kiran, in the, uh, in the Platanese, uh, in Greece. But he spent much of his formative years in that expanding Greek city we know as Johannesburg. He learned some of those what it was to be an outsider, a refugee. Later, George Bezos would become a lawyer and an advocate, defending the rights of those oppressed under the apartheid regime in South Africa. He became devoted to the struggle. The list of people he had defended reads like a most distinguished list of the main protagonists in South Africa. I can only, only cite some of the examples for you here. Walter Sisulu, Nelson Mandela, Steve Biko, Ruben Mbeki, Winnie Mandela, and in Zimbabwe, Morgan Swangarai. Later, George Bezos was instrumental in drafting the Truth and Reconciliation Act for the new South Africa. Not surprisingly, he's been decorated with many international honors, from the International Bar Association, for example, and he's also received the Order of the Meritorious Service from President Mandela himself. It is said that George Bezos has been uh, invited to take up a number of positions in the new South Africa, to be a member of parliament, a judge, and then as well as a cabinet minister. He declined each of those. George Bezos has published his autobiography, Odyssey to Freedom, in 2007. And few books could recount, recount a more impressive life <coughs> dedicated to defending basic human rights. He has lived so much of the recent history of South Africa. Throughout his uh, activity, however, George Bezos has remained true to his Greek origins and Hellenism. In the 1970s, for example, he helped establish a Greek school uh, with the abbreviation Zaheti, South African, I've forgotten. What? Hellenic Educational and Technical Institute. Thank you. Our, our fathers named it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a Greek school in uh, South Africa which accepted children from all ethnicities uh, and from mixed marriages as well in the 1970s. The school, in that sense, challenged and broke down barriers. It remained non-exclusionary throughout the apartheid regime. Tonight's lecture is suitably entitled Hellenism, Universal Rights and Apartheid. It is truly a privilege to introduce our speaker to you uh, tonight. He has kindly agreed that after his presentation, he will take questions and, uh, and have uh, a discussion with the audience and we look forward to that. So there'll be plenty of time for you to ask uh, questions.
But before doing so, can you please join me uh, in what is, as I say, a true privilege of uh, inviting to the podium our speaker this evening, George Bezos. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Uh, I received a letter in the post and the title of, to my lecture sounded a little strange. Hellenism, human rights, that I could understand. But apartheid, that's too much of a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> but. Thank you for the opportunity of addressing you here, young and old, in such a prestigious place of high learning. And uh, I am delighted to hear of the spirit of Hellenism is well and alive in this institution. Thank you very much for your efforts. I'll have to hold it. The subtitle that I'm starting with is Hellenism, Greek Language, and Greek Culture. Hellenism is a term with various shades of meaning. The term is reported to have originated in the 7th century BC when a number of tribes in the, what is now Greece formed a league and began to call themselves Hellenes. One of the common factors that united them was their language. Professor Constantine Tripanis was a classical scholar who lived and taught classical literature in Greece, the United Kingdom, Oxford, and the United States. In 1981, he published in Greek and translated into English the, the, the work Greek Poetry from Homer to Seferis, in which he asserts that despite changes over a period of more than 3,000 years, there is no other language with such a long tradition. My Hindu friends, question this, by the way, and they've given me a very thick book to prove it, but I haven't managed to go through it completely. Today we refer to ancient Greek as a language that was spoken and written before the beginning of the Christian era. But the Greek language has a rich history and has evolved significantly over its 34th century history. Kini Greek was the language in which the New Testament and the Christian Bible was written. Katharevusa, Greek was popular with the church and the elite, elite class. Democratic Greek, Greek or Demotiki, is the modern form of the Greek language which was used by poets, writers, and the common people for many years since early as 1818 but was officially recognized only in 1976. George Seferis and Odysseus Editis, both Greek nationals, who wrote in Demotic Greek, won the Nobel Prize for literature in the 20th century. Soldiers, teachers, merchants, architects, philosophers, others left what is now mainland Greece and established themselves globally in many lands and could including the Hellespont, Egypt, Asia Minor, Italy, Armenia, and Russia. They introduced the Greek language, art, culture, and religious practices in these places, and it spread. During the late, the late 6th and early 5th century BC, the word Hellenism acquired a new meaning. In inverted commas, doing things the Greek way. This new meaning could be found not only 
in the city-states in mainland Greece, but also in the islands, and especially in the city-states where Athens did business. The form of government in most of these states, if not dictatorial or democratic, was generally speaking oligarchical. In about 594 BC, Solon became the archon of Athens. Solon was determined to reform Ath the Athens constitution and laws to put an end to the tyrannical practices of the rich against the poorer classes. He to introduce laws that would enable poor farmers who had been enslaved to get their land back and to prohibit its enslavement if a debt was not paid. Solon's most important contribution was constitutional reform. Widely considered the father of democracy, Solon extended the franchise to the poor. They received the right to be members of the ecclesia or the assembly. They received the right to be members of the ecclesia and to partake, partake in, just, in the justice system by sitting on a jury and having a say in the manner in which magistrates were appointed. In order to, to, to prevent plutocrats from making changes, Solon introduced provision in his constitution that would make it difficult to amend. He then left Athens in order to avoid impeachment by the rich. When Clisthenes became archon, he relied on his foundation. He amended the constitution to prevent the three tribes of Athens from depriving the newly enfranchised Athenians. He divided Athens into an additional 10 areas and established demos. This is where democracy comes from. He, a good English translation would be wards, I suppose. He also enfranchised, emancipated slaves, admitted many skilled workers as citizens. This broke the power of previously exercised by the three tribes and uh, their noble families and friends. In order to prevent tyrants from taking over, he introduced provisions in the constitution to ostracize strong-minded persons. The reforms of Solon and Clisthenes in the 6th and 5th centuries are similar to some of the fundamental human rights prescribed in democratic countries in the 21st century, including some which were now described as secret socioeconomic rights, which are condemned by ultra-conservatives of our age. In the middle, middle of the 5th century BC has been described as the golden age of Greece, particularly when Pericles was the archon of Athens. Athens was the mistress of the seas. Her fleet was unbeatable. Merchants, teachers, artists, architects, and others were welcomed by the Hellenized city states beyond Greece's borders. The Spartans were jealous of her extended sphere of influence. In 431 BC, the Spartans began the Peloponnesian War by invading Attica, which Athens could not defend. However, the Spartans could not invade the city of Athens, in which the Parthenon was built on the Acropolis. Pericles spoke about his glorious city and the values of its citizens. As recorded by Thucydides, Pericles spoke, and I quote, the Athenian constitution and the Athenian way of life that brought us to greatness. Pericles' funeral oration for those who fell defending Attica from the Spartans is re relevant to any concern with hum human rights today. I quote at some length because I think it is the very basis of democracy and the very basis of human rights. He declared, for our system is government does not copy the systems of our neighbors. We are a model to them, not they to us. Our, our constitution is called a democracy because power rests in the hands not of the few but of the many. Our laws guarantee equal justice for all 
in their private disputes and as for the election of public officials who welcome talent to every arena of achievement. Nor do we make our choices on the grounds of class, but on the grounds of excellence alone. And as we give free play to all in our public life, so we carry the same spirit into our daily relations with one another. We acknowledge the restraint of reverence. We are obedient to those in authority and to the laws, especially to those that give protection to the oppressed and those unwritten laws of the heart whose transgression brings admitted shame. He doesn't use the word human rights, but what is the difference between that? But those laws that give protection to the oppressed and those unwritten laws that are not to be disobeyed. And then, probably the most famous words over written. We are lovers of beauty without extravagance and lovers of wisdom without effeminacy. I hope this does not offend the women in the audience. We differ from other states in regarding the man who keeps aloof from public life, not as private, but as useless. Incidentally, the Greek word used, idiotis. Idiotis means a man that looks after only his own affairs. The Greeks have enriched the, Greek, uh, the English language. The word idiot, if you look at that in the dictionary, <laughs> is the uh, word that uh, he meant. We decide or debate carefully and in person all matters of policy. And we hold not that words and deeds go ill together but that acts are foredoomed to failure when undertaken undiscussed. In a word, I say our city as a whole is an education to Greece that our citizens yield to none, man by man, for independence of spirit, many-sidedness of attainment, and complete self-reliance and looms and brain. <coughs> Men of the future will wonder at us, as all men do today. We need no Homer or other man of words to praise us. For you now it remains to rival what they have done, and knowing that the secret of happiness is freedom, and that the secret of freedom is a brave heart, not idly to stand aside from the enemy's onslaught. I would like to say that those words have been very meaningful to me throughout my life and I unashamedly say that they have played a role in shaping my own life. Later the war did not go well for the Athenians. Many, many had died on the battlefield and even more who were victims of the plague. Their former allies were abandoning them. The islands of Mytilene and Lesbos fortified their harbors. Arthur was accused by them of the number of transgressions, abusing the funds of the Delian League, which was formed, by the way, that the funds were really to enable any future Persian attempted invasion to be dealt with. Athens was accused of a number of transgressions, abusing the funds of the Delian League, dealing with their members, not as allies, but as dependents, departing from the traditions of candid and independent thinking about fundamental issues involved in the life of the individual and the community, and the, ignoring the Greek principle that the unexamined life is not life for man. The Athenians perceived this as a revolt and a defiance of their leadership. The islands sent men to Athens to negotiate. 
the Athenians rejected their offers and their leader of the delegation was executed. The Athenian assembly was convened and almost unanimous, unanimously resolved to sentence all the male citizens of Mytilene to death. The women and children would be sold into slavery. A trireme was dispatched to Mytilene to implement the decision. The leader who had proposed the punishment was one Cleon. But there was a Diodotus called for a new gathering of the assembly for the following day in order to revoke the harsh and inhumane punishment imposed on the Mytilenians. In what has become known as the Mytilenian debate between Cleon and the auditors, Cleon began by questioning the very value of democracy. Listen to the words that you must have heard that be familiar from others these days. Personally, said Cleon, I have had occasion often enough already to observe that the democracy is incapable of governing others. This is to the assembly of Athenians. And I'm all the more convinced of this when I see how you are now changing your minds about the Mytilenians. Cleon proceeded to question the very worth of free speech and described the Athenians as victims of their own pleasure in listening are more like an audience sitting at the feet of a professional lecturer, she healed with that professor, than a parliament discussing matters of state. The auditors responded as follows. Haste and anger are the two greatest obstacles to wise counsel. The auditors considered whether the question was not whether the Mytilenians were guilty so much as to whether the Athenians were making the right decision for themselves. The auditors went on to question whether the death penalty was really a means of deterrence from revolt or just the opposite and said, quote, we should recognize that the proper basis of our security is good administration rather in fear of legal penalties. He finished, finished by asking the Athenians fundamentally to question what is right and just and ask them to look to moderation rather than aggressive punishment. The auditors urged the Athenians to spare the Athenians in an effort to create an alliance. The, the assembly revoked the earlier decision Another, another trial was sent to stop the first and the lives of the total male population and the freedom of the women and children were saved. But more than a thousand islanders were killed in the skirmishes before that came about. Thucydides, who recorded these events, made the following observation. Indeed, it is true that in these acts of revenge on others, men take it upon themselves to begin the process of repealing these general laws of humanity, which are there to give hope of salvation to all who are in distress, instead of leaving those laws in existence, remembering that there may, be, there may come a time when they too will be in danger and need will need their protection. The general laws of humanity referred to by Thucydides were the written laws from the time of Dracos, Solon, and Pistenes when they were archons. These laws were enacted with checks and balances and approved by committees of the assembly, the dicastes or judges, and the archons. There were also provisions as to how the laws had to be applied particularly those guilty of homicide. And a personal or semi-personal note. We quoted the cities often, not only as lawyers, but academics and human rights lawyers, as a threat to the apartheid regime. During apartheid times, 
criticizing the government by quoting ancient authority was likely to escape the attention of the security police. It's not me speaking. It's the city's bad point. <laughs> From the 6th century BC, theater played an important part in Athenian life. Euripides wrote Tro Trojan women in which Hecuba utters words to this effect. Remember? Euripides? Greek? In Athens? And a paraphrase pushes, uses much longer. It's a true paraphrase. She says, O oh, foolish men who for the love of gold left your country, your wives and children, and came to destroy ours, to kill my husband, my sons, and my grandson as Theanax, in order to put an end to the Prime's kingdom, to Prime's kingdom and to make my daughters the concubines of your leaders. Not a good Athenian to say that thing to the Athenians. Euripides offended them so much by breaching the rule prohibiting use of theatre to present controversial subjects. Not only was he refused the prize of having presented the best play, but he was fine. Freedom of expression had its limitations even during the Golden Age. In his comedy, The Clouds, Aristophanes mocks Socrates and the unlettered peasant who is about to kick his two sleeping spades on the floor of the passage of his house. Peasant draws back his foot and then stops, cursing the wall that prohibits him from kicking them. Aristophanes' audience knew that the first that during the first invasion of Attica, by the Spartans, thousands of Athenian slaves had joined the Spartans to be a slave of the dictatorial regime. Regime is. Not so good if there is someone where you will not be a slave, even though it may be, it may be a dictatorship. <coughs> Athenians more, were more tolerant of utterances, utterances by comedians than those who wrote tragedies. Troubles such as the war, the plague, and the death of Pericles undermined the commitment of the Athenians to democracy in the same way in our times. The values of democracies are threatened in the name of security. And some very bad sounding excuses. When the Secretary of State, of one of the great powers, was accused of condoning through torture, he said, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know torture. What torture is? I hear these things. If it's torture, well, it's torture. Kings, oligarchs, and even tyrants mimic Athenian democracy who wanted to be seen to apply principles of Hellenism. Athenians, led by Demosthenes, would not recognize the Macedonians as Hellenes but said they were barbarians, despite the fact that King Philip employed Aristotle to teach his son Alexander. On the other hand, Socrates defined the Hellenes as those who have partaken of our learning. Very significant words. King Philip was anxious to establish his authority over most, if not all, Greeks. He knew that even if he won battles, he could not be accepted as leader of the Hellenes. That is likely the, the likely reason that he invited Aristotle to educate, educate his heir, Alexander. King Philip's, King Philip's ambition would not be fulfilled. His son's conquests throughout the Greek world and beyond were achieved through persuasion of those who peacefully succumbed to his will and brutal conduct to, to those who did not surrender. 
His vision of a Hellenic world partly accommodated Eastern and at times not so democratic culture spread. A form of Hellenism throughout the provincial provinces ruled by the Persian Empire from Egypt to India. He founded cities and changed the names of others to Alexandria. His successors followed it. The Peloponnesian War, which the Spartans won, weakened the Athens and her allies. Sparta and her allies could not unify the cities of Greece to oppose Roman expansionism. The Romans may have occupied the Hellenic world militarily, but they were enchanted by the Hellenistic language and our culture. It was the Romans, by the way, who changed our name from Hellenes or Hellenes to Greeks. I have no objection to being referred to as either. The Roman esteem for Hellenism expressed itself in various ways. Nero contrived to win many prizes at the Olympic Games, and Hadrian was described as an ardent admirer of Greece who sought to make Athens the cultural capital of the Roman Empire. Famously, Shakespeare, her Cicero addressing the crowd gathered after Julius Caesar's death in Greek, although might, that might tell us more about Elizabethan England than Rome. But let me remind you, you may have forgotten the scene when Casca, I think his name was, the not so bright conspirator the murder of Caesar, who follows those at Brut Brutus and uh, others who went out of uh, Rome to hide. And they left this man be behind to report. And he came, and they were anxious to hear who spoke after Caesar's death. And they asked, did Anthony speak? Yea, yeah, Lord, he did speak. And what did he say? He gives this ordinary man, uh, although one of the co conspirators, uh, gave a garbled version of the French Romans countryman speech. And then they asked him, Did Cicero speak? Yes, my Lord. Cicero spoke. What did he say? He spoke Greek, my Lord. Yes, but what did he say? Nay, the Lord, it was all Greek to me. <laughs> and that's the origin of the expression which we have to live, we have to live with. But we'll take it. Hadrian amended the legal code which forbade torture. He did not go so far as to abolish slavery, but made mitigating provisions to avoid its harshness. Schiller described Hadrian, Hadrian as the empire's first servant. Edward Gibbon called him an active genius, noting his equity and moderation, and further commenting that his era was the happiest era in human history. Hellenism's polytheism brought it into the conflict with monotheism of the Hebrews and the early Christians, despite the fact that Greek was the language used by the early Christians, and moreover that the texts were in Aramaic and Greek. Christianity became more widespread after the Emperor of Constantine, and his mother adopted Christianity as a religion. During that time, the Christian church accepted some of the philosophical principles of Hellenism. After the fall of Byzantium, many of the classical Greek writings on philosophy, astronomy, medicine, and science in general were translated into Arabic. When Constantinople fell to the Ottomans in 1953, there is an exodus to the West. The Renaissance era began. Many of the works were translated by Italian, German, French, English, Irish, and Latin American scholars. 
the Lutherans, Calvinists, and Slavs, and the Russians translated the Greek religious and liturgical texts into their languages. The political, social, and economic changes of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries and the rise of the age of reason ushered in what may be described as the golden years of Hellenism. Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian columns were considered essential for the facade of public buildings, universities, museums, and galleries. You only have to go and live in the 18th or 19th century hotel and you will see these columns. And and astronomers, mathematicians, physicists, doctors, chemists, pharmacists, engineers, inventors, and others introduced Greek words into English. You've probably heard of the word that we Greeks should be proud. Proud. Don't worry. Greeks have a word for it. And let me we all know what xenophobia means, don't we? I, I take umbrage that uh, the English decided to pronounce a clear Greek X as a Z, but that, that, that's another thing. That's another thing. Xenophobia. At an audience not much different to the one I asked whether anybody knew what uh, xenophilia meant. Mm. There were a couple of Greeks, but I told them if you're Greek, please don't. <laughs> you, you're excluded. Hardly anybody knew. The lecture was about refugees. But we Greeks have words for it. <laughs> Greek names were used by newly established towns and states in America. Greek, Latin, and classics are still taught by leading universities. Philadelphians rejoiced when in March 1821 the war of independence was declared by the people of Greece. The Philiki Eteria, the Friendly Society, a secret organization had canvassed support for the exclusion of the Ottoman Empire from Greece. Many responded. The most famous, Lord Byron, was the most prominent of those who went to Greece and wrote poems and prayers of the revolt. He even cursed his countryman, Lord Elgin, for having removed works of art from the Parthenon. We'll not discuss this today, simply for another day. <laughs> Lord Byron is considered one of the heroes of the Greek independence. Upon his death, Dionysius Solomos, who wrote a hymn to liberty, wrote a praise poem entreating liberty to stop lashing out with its sword and to join the Greeks in mourning the death of Lord Byron. His statue is among the heroes of the revolution. Democracy had to compete with royalty in the newly independent Hellenic Republic because after the Napoleonic Wars, Metternich of the Austrian Empire could not envisage a state without a king. Military putsches would take over during the 20th century, 20th century until democracy was firmly established in 1974 by the previously examined Prime Minister Konstantinos Karamanlis. It is not a direct democracy such as envisaged by Solon and Christianis, but with it. all its recent problems, it appears to be working. I have an answer because I'm inevitably going to be asked what is happening in Greece now. The answer is, don't worry, it will remain Greek. 
It is clear that human rights have a history that spans millennia. I will take a moment to speak briefly about human rights over the last hundred years, particularly as they exist or are absent in South Africa. Shortly after his release from prison, Nelson Mandela visited the small committee drafting the proposed Bill of Rights and Constitution. His advice to us that we had to make sure that the Constitution was good for all the people of South Africa, not only a particular political party. His view prevailed both at the negotiating table in Condesa, the negotiation forum at the end of 1993, and the Constituent Assembly after the first democratic election. The South African Constitution was enacted by more than 80% of the democratically elected parliamentary representatives in 1995 and certified by the Constitutional Court as compliant with the 34 the democratic principles agreed to by the delegates of more than 10, 20 political parties and other organizations at CODESA. The Constitution is not cast in stone. A number of amendments have been adopted by the necessary to thirds majority. None of the founding principles have been altered. We must all make sure that they are not. I, I'm going to uh, leave out what I have to say in writing about apartheid. You all know that it came to power in 1948 and you know that it was declared a by the United Nations as a crime against humanity. Uh, what I do want to say is that South Africa was not a totalitarian state during the apartheid year. There was that little bit of space for lawyers, academics, people who were lovers of liberty to do quite a bit in order to alleviate the suffering of the dispossessed people majority of the people in the country. There were many judges, some of them very bad judges, but there were some good ones who actually used the equitable principles in order to alleviate the harshness of the statute laws established by the apartheid regime. We were fortunate in having a leader in Mr. Mandela who was trusted by the vast majority of the people to that they had nothing to fear, sorry, that they had nothing to fear if fundamental change uh, came into being. A group of us lawyers formed an organization called Lawyers for Human Rights. Prime Minister John Foster became very upset and made a public statement that human rights were getting out of hand in South Africa. <laughs> the leader of the struggle was Nelson Mandela. So that you may understand 
What could happen to a man like Mandela under the apartheid regime? Let me give you a few details. We were fellow students from 1948. He was my senior and qualified earlier and started practicing. We were at the same university. There was a very small number of black students. It was one of the two universities which was called an open university because it did take a small number of black students. Nelson Mandela's ambition was to become the member of the bar and to be the first black advocate of barrister in South Africa. But he was prevented from doing so by the dean of the faculty of law. He failed one of his subjects. And the, the, although he, one would have expected he was entitled to a supplementary examination, the dean refused his request. He told Mandela that a black man would never succeed as an advocate or as a member of the bar. In order to succeed, said the dean, you had to be a member of the privileged white society. Mandela had no option but to abandon his ambition and change from a degree to a diploma and become a solicitor. As a student, Mandela was the leader of the African National Congress Youth League. When he became a solicitor together with Oliver Tambo in the early 1950s, he became the volunteer in chief of the defiance campaign inspired by Mahatma Gandhi to peaceful protest against discriminatory laws. At the end of the campaign, he and seven others were charged with contravening the Separate Amenities Act as well as the suppression of Communism Act, and would decide with others to do the same. He was convicted and given a suspended sentence. The Law Society brought an application to strike him off the role of attorneys because he had committed a criminal offense. To the honor of our profession, the most senior most respected member of the bar, Walter Pollack, represented him and successfully submitted to the two judges here in the application that the offense he had committed was a political offense in there which those, there was no turpitude involved. Mandela and Oliver Tambo could not lawfully occupy office space in the city or near the courts because this space was reserved for whites only. They were threatened with prosecution under the Group Areas Act, and if convicted, they would either go to prison or be required to pay a fairly fine. Senior members of the bar intervened on their, intervened on their behalf, and the authorities turned a blind eye. Mandela and Oliver Tambo's legal practice was restricted to weekends when the court was in session. They were both charged with treason. Their trial had started for their arrest in December 56. They were acquitted in 1961. Mandela became the provincial leader of the African National Congress and played an active role in the adoption of the Freedom Charter. He and 150 others were charged with treason at the end of 1956. At the trial, Mandela gave evidence to the effect that the Freedom Charter was not a document heralding the establishment of a communist state, nor was it designed to overthrow the white regime by violence. The accused were represented by a team of top lawyers and gave cogent evidence that all that they wanted was a democratic South Africa. They won the case and were discharged on June 
1961, after a trial that lasted five years. In 1961, Mandela took the initiative to form a military wing in order to attack symbols of apartheid, taking great care that there would be no loss of life. He attempted to form an organization with similar aims and objects as the African National Congress. The government's heavy-handed treatment of those involved led to the abandonment of that scheme. In 1962, Mandela left South Africa unlawfully for approximately six months to seek help from the independent African states the non-aligned movement and also from the Labour Party in the United Kingdom. Upon his return to South Africa, he was charged for unlawful living in the country. During the trial, he made his famous speech, a black man in a white man's court. He was found guilty and was sentenced to five years in prison. While Mandela was in prison, police arrested a number of ANC leaders on July 11, 1963, in a farm called Livonia, north of Johannesburg. Mandela was also brought in, and they were charged with sabotage, which was easier to prove than treason, but the death penalty was provided for and for pl pl plotting a foreign invasion of South Africa. They became, the case became known as worldwide as the Livonia trial. The prosecution compared the accused to members of the Red Brigade of Italy, the border main half of Germany, and the PLO terrorist organization in Palestine, so they say. The smear did not stick. The word preferred the vision of the accused, that they wanted freedom to live in a country where the human rights of all people were protected. You must be familiar with Mandela made the following closing remarks. During my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to the struggle of the African people. I have fought against white domination, and I have fought against black domination. I've cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. The main and only witness to give evidence in mitigation of sentence was the celebrated writer Alan Payton. I'm sure that most of you are familiar, particularly his uh, novel, Cry the Beloved Country, which I am told has more than 30 million copies printed. Alan Payton was the head of the Liberal Party. He had no hesitation to come to the witness box and give evidence. And he said, I know the people in the dock. They are the legitimate leaders of the majority of the people in South Africa. Sentence them to death and execute them. We whites will one day will want to negotiate with credible leaders of the majority of the people of, of the country. Kill them and we will have no one to negotiate with. Prophetic words. They were all convicted. It was feared that there would be a death sentence. <coughs> the 
And then I was in prison on Robben Island, where he spent the next 18 of his 27 years in prison. I was the only advocate or barrister that had access to Nelson Mandela throughout his lengthy imprisonment. You had to spend the whole day on the island because the ferry took you there in the morning and only left, left late in the afternoon. We had a lot of time to talk. It was inevitable, inevitable that we would speak about democracy, various forms of government, and speculate about the future about which we were both optimistic. He also related to me what he and his fellow prisoners did when they were not breaking stones at the quarry. They put on plays, <coughs> including Antigone by Sophocles. Nelson Mandela played the role of Creon the dictatorial king who would put Antigone to death for, contrary to his decree, burying her brother. Nelson told me about this. And he added, fortunately, the prison authorities did not know what it was about, and that's why they allowed it. <laughs> uh, he and I did know, and we also know, knew that they played Unwill's uh, version of Antigone after the French occupation of France by the Nazis. <coughs> and it went on for months. The Germans didn't know that there were adaptations in the classical play in order to incite people to take part in the resistance. And uh, I'll never forget about the difference. Ismini was reminded because I want to thank Ismini because she's in the audience and she's arranged uh, my life uh, and my travels and everything else. Ismini is a weak character in the play of Sophocles. But the chorus draws the attention of Creon that the ideas of Antigone are catching on. Have you heard what Ismini has said? And he put words in Ismini's mouth which accorded with that of uh, Antigone. Uh, the, he told me that it was a great lesson for him, that it was very important that rulers although they may think that they have all the power in the world, have to exercise that power reasonably. This is why in our constitution, the word reason or reasonably appears on no less than 32 times. When I visited the ancient Olympia, Olympia Whilst Mandela was still in prison, the mayor told me that the municipal council had declared him an honorary citizen. The mayor told me that they had written to Mandela in prison to inform him of this and were disappointed that there had been no reply. On my next visit to Robben Island, I asked Mandela whether he had seen the letter. He had not, but was very excited and said, I have been, uh, I've been told of many honors bestowed on me, but none is more significant to me than this honor. Please write to them on my behalf and tell them how grateful I am. Mandela and I had made a pact that if the Olympics took place in Athens to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the modern Olympics, 
which began in 1886 in Athens. The two of us would go together. Our pact was based on optimism that he would be free from life in prison and the 1988 Olympics would be given to Greece. Unfortunately, neither, neither happened. He was still in prison and Greece didn't get uh, the Olympics, but only much later. But Nelson Mandela, his wife, Grasha, Michelle, and my wife, Arenti, and I w went to Greece with the four of us after he was freed. His term of president had come to an end. The main purpose was Nelson Mandela was to sign the Olympic truce in preparation for the Athens Olympics in 2000. There was a loan hope by George Papandreou, who was then Minister of Foreign Affairs, that if Mandela called that all wars should stop during the period that the Olympics were taking place, it might catch on. The world didn't listen to Mandela. When we got to Athens, went to the hotel, the curtains had been drawn. I opened them and said, Nelson, come look. Before us was a breathtaking view of the Parthenon. He looked and looked and looked again and said, George, why do I feel like I've been here before? He couldn't explain it, and neither could I. But I, I would like to think that Mandela was simply impressed by all things Greek. When he became president, I was present with him with a Greek, Greek television crew interviewing him. I remember that the person asking the questions asked him, what did he think of Greece? This was his response. I know a lot about Greece. I consider her the mother of democracy. I only hope that one day South Africa will become her first worthy daughter. Thank you for listening to me. Take one at a time. We'll take one at a time. If you can simply identify yourself, Andrew Dismal. Uh, Andrew Dismal, former chair of the Select Committee on Human Rights in Parliament. It was very interesting to hear your quote from John Verston because uh, successive Home Secretaries here have had very similar things to say about the Human Rights Act. But my question is only about social and economic rights, which you touched at in the beginning of your contribution and showing a link back to, to ancient Greece. The, when I was in South Africa studying your constitution, Albi Sachs said to me that a country without social and economic rights in its constitution was a country without aspiration. When I talked to South African politicians from the ANC, they were starting to have second thoughts about whether it was a good idea to have actually included that in their constitution because of the difficulties that it had caused the government in the post-apartheid era. Do you think it was such a good idea to include social and economic rights 
And do you think it's actually achieved the aspirations that you had for it when you dropped that part of the Constitution? Uh, yes. Uh, I must disclose that uh, I am the senior counsel at the Legal Resources Centre. It's a constitutional litigation unit uh, started by Chief Justice uh, Chesterson. And I, he was bound to, go to become a judge. And I, I took over for the, the, the Centre. I think that the criticism of uh, the provision for socio-economic rights is a misguided one. The people that uh, say it promises housing, uh, you can't go, who do you go to and say, give me a house? Um, therefore, you've got no answer, therefore, but you probably came across the housing case uh, where a thousand people were moved by the city council on a rainy night and dumped on a football field. And they say, no, this is a violation of section 26 of the constitution which provides that we have a right to housing. So, Albie Sachs was on that court. He's a great supporter of uh, socioeconomic rights. Incidentally, he was on the committee that we served together, and uh, he made a tremendous contribution. But, Mrs. Ruthburg brought a class action on behalf of the thousand to the Constitution as a matter of urgency. And they said, what are we to do? We had our shacks, at least it was a roof on the head. You say that we needed the ground for, for development purposes. The court found an answer. The government's the government's policy is contained in the document that the, about how we will provide housing for the future. And they handed it in, as thick as it was, to the 11th judge. Arthur Chasperson, the Chief Justice, said, this is quite a tone. Can you please refer us to the page where the situation of these people is dealt with in your policy. <coughs> oh, but in five years we'll have so many houses, in three years. No, 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 you misunderstand me. Tonight, where are these people going to sleep tonight? And they made a McDonald's an order that the city council was obliged to take tents, other cover, give them blankets, give them food install waters, put their toilets as a matter of urgency. And if they lagged behind, the applicants were encouraged to come back for uh, a number stricter order in relation to time. So uh, a lot of people want to dismiss the jurisprudence, particularly particularly people who do not believe that South Africa as a whole have a right to live in a more equitable society. Uh, it's worked out. There was no school in the Eastern Cape. At our office in Grahamstown, wrote an application, it took a few months, but they were ordered last year to have a school ready for 400 children of this area that had no school at all. They did it. It's one of the defenses may be resources permitting. Yes, but the greater the urgency, 
the greater the need for promotion up of the, the list in order to, to do it. So I think that our constitution was well advised. People that adopted it, newly elected representatives, did right in accepting it. It is working, not as well as we could can. <coughs> We've had people that had no water. The courts, two courts, three courts were involved. They all agreed that some water must be given, but there was a difficulty about how many uh, liters or gallons per household. But these are all problems. But justice has to find solutions in order to avoid violence, in order to avoid revolt, in order to, you know, after all, after all, I have an objection to justice being represented as blindfolded. I think we must take that down, yeah. that holding off so that you can see and, and uh, act more swiftly. Thank you. Gentlemen, here, please. Can you, you have a few questions? Sorry. Can you, can you use the microphone? Can you have a true blessing to a journalist? I'll go back to the point in this you are most admired lecture about uh, the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Yes. How do you evaluate his role in this? I call it preparatory transition from the Roman Empire to Byzantium. And can I have a question to you, Professor? Will the text of the lecture be published? Thank you. I think I've got the easy question. <laughs> uh, yes, I meant to say that uh, in actual fact, as you can see, there is a camera at the back of the room. Uh, each of our public lectures now are available for downloading as a podcast, and the transcript of tonight's lecture, George Business has kindly uh, provided us with the transcript, and you'll be able to download that from the site of the Hellenic Observatory uh, later this week, uh, so certainly. Um, it's not a brief question that you've asked, and I wonder if uh, you'd like to make just a very brief yes, comment. Yes, uh, uh, a brief comment. You know, compared to Nero and uh, other uh, bloodthirsty emperors, he was a good man from the point of view of uh, his ideals as a Hellenist. And this is why he is admired so much by, by us Greeks. And uh, not only us, but uh, the quotes of, uh, from uh, the great historians that, uh, that value him that way. Thank you. Uh, time perhaps just for uh, one more question, right at the very back, please. Um, you, you may have, I'm almost certain you've followed the recent events in South Africa regarding... Sorry, if you could identify yourself. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm identify myself. Okay, uh, my name is Raphael Smith. I'm born and raised in South Africa, but I've lived in London for the last 12 years. Uh, a keen interest in South African affairs and such like. The recent events, uh, in fact, the news broke yesterday or the day before, of the Dalai Lama being refused a visa in South Africa, uh, almost certainly for political purposes with regards to the relationship that South Africa currently has with the Chinese. Th that's, a, that's just a sort of a current event, but the question I want to draw from that, the wider question I want to draw is, how vulnerable is the, 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 the democratic principles that you outlined, you know, the ones that were set in the initial series of negotiations, how vulnerable are those, in your opinion, ultimately to what they call real politic, to things that slowly but surely creep in and how, I know you described that small space that was available during the apartheid years to lawyers and jurisprudential types who figured their way out and around the system. How, how 
it's a very wonderful image of these lawyers who ultimately toppled this massive system. But when no, you have a, didn't do it. the people did it. Yeah, the people did it. I, I appreciate that, but helped, helped or assisted or provided an intellectual groundwork at least. <laughs> My question is, in a context that's a, a, that at this moment calls itself democratic, calls itself constitutional. In other words, is it not that much more vulnerable in a strange way to attack because it defends itself by saying we are democratic? So I want to know what, what is your okay. opinion of that? Yes. Uh, specifically in relation to the Dalai Lama, I was very disappointed. And I think that this business of so far he withdrew his application and we couldn't do it. Uh, I only noticed that my visa to come to, 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 to London uh, expired uh, on the 31st of August, <laughs> three days before I was to be here. Uh, my secretary found uh, the, the Consul General of uh, Johannesburg and uh, uh, they said, well, you know, six or seven days it will take, but you know, but he's going to catch a plane on Friday night. I said, well, let, come, let him come and let's see what we can do. And I explained the position, I apologized, I think, put them under pressure, and uh, they said, uh, Give us your secretary's uh, uh, cell phone and we will send uh, a message. The next morning a message came, your visa, it will be here in Johannesburg from Pretoria. <laughs> At 11 o'clock, please come and fetch it. So I don't buy this business so far, it takes time. But real politics is unhappily part of life. I was most disappointed that a most senior politician in the United States, when he was asked a question, but you are being inconsistent, you go into Libya, but you don't go into Syria. And you know what his answer was? It may be inconsistent, but sometimes inconsistency is good politics. <laughs> you know, unashamedly. And I, I don't buy this business that the Dalai, that the Dalai Lama uh, withdrew his application. They made it impossible for him. Uh, and uh, Do you think nobody, nobody, nobody will take responsibility. The, 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 they've already got their excuse that uh, we uh, we don't take instructions from the Chinese now we're in a democratic country but uh, he was through his application uh, they don't fool me but I'm not sure that they don't fool you and many other people but that is the, uh, the lack of realism in, uh, in con that even inconsistency is considered to be good politics Thank you. We're out of time, but uh, I've already mentioned about the lecture being available uh, for you. Uh, in closing, can I thank once again the London Hellenic Society for uh, uh, facilitating the lecture. And let me, <laughs> and let me also invite you to uh, show your appreciation in the usual way. Uh, for this uh, most interesting uh, lecture, and we've been delighted to host George Bezos. Thank you very much indeed.